My choice was to celebrate the 100th anniversary by sharing the stories of this of this organization and the lessons that can be learned from it. That is author J. Jeff Kober, and you're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. Hey there, thanks for joining me here on episode 213 of the Tomorrow Society Podcast. I am your host, Dan Heaton, as we roll into December. Wow, we are just flying along. This month, I'm going to have a few interviews with authors that have written books I've enjoyed. This one is with J. Jeff Kober, who's written multiple books, including his latest book, A Century of Powerful Disney Insights, Volume 1. He's focusing on the history of the Disney Company. This one is focusing on 1923 to 1973, which he titles The Walt and Roy Disney Years, which seems pretty accurate given that they were involved for nearly all of them. Jeff has a background with consulting and business work. He worked at the Disney Institute in the 1990s and has written books on customer service and other areas of Disney relating to inspiration and lessons we can take from Disney's history in life and business. And that is the case with this book where he is looking at key elements of the history of the company, like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Son of the Strike, and Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, but taking them from a slightly different angle, where in short chapters, he's kind of coming to some takeaways that connect to the history of the Disney company. So it was really cool to get a chance to talk to Jeff about his book, about his background, and near the end, just kind of a fun chat about what we enjoy about the parks from the past and current present day attractions that have been added recently. So let's get right to it. Here is J. Jeff Kober. How are you today, Dan? I'm doing good. Thank you for being on the show. Oh, it's my honor. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, no problem. I really enjoyed the new book. I'm still trying to figure out how you got 50 years into a book, but you did a very good job with it. But before we talk about that, we're going to talk all about that. I'd like to learn a bit more about you and your sure. background. And so I'm curious just how you got interested in Disneyland and Disney Company, like growing up, like what really grabbed you about that? Or what was your kind of story where you got interested in it? You know, my earliest memory of my father was actually carrying me down Main Street after the fireworks at Disneyland. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, I have very early memories of the parks. We would go every couple of years. On one occasion, growing up in Phoenix, if there was rain, which seldom happens, but rain sent you to the school library. And as I was in the school library, I found this old box with a bunch of old National Geographics in it. And I found this one, which featured the magical worlds of Walt Disney. It was a big 30, 40 page spread. I don't know if you've seen it, but it fascinated me. It talked about the history of animation It or the history of the company. It showed the process of animation. It showed things like animatronics that had a fold out image of Disneyland at that time. And I was riveted. I kept going back to the library, even though the sun came out, I kept going back to the library day after day. And I finally got the courage to ask the librarian, could I keep this copy? <laughs> and she did. She gave it to me. And I, from there, grew a an enormous love of, I asked to go to Disney that summer. We went. It was the summer. Bear Country opened up at Disneyland with the Country Bear Jamboree and the Main Street Electrical Parade started and so i do i remember the old flat versions the old dragon um and a lot of the older pieces over the years but um i was so riveted i said to my parents we got to go next year and my parents i think were a little concerned that this was <laughs> getting too too much so they said no and in my wrath i swore that would never happen again so i started 
a lawn mowing business in seventh grade to raise the money to take my family to Disneyland. And literally, it was, I think, the first summer that the Howard Johnson's at Hojo opened up across from Disneyland. My dad checked in for me, but I paid for the hotel. I think he got it figured out so we could have a the top floor with a view that overlooked tomorrow. I was so excited, but then I realized there was something called the Disneyland hotel. And so that set my, my <laughs> sights higher. And I was like, Oh, I got to do this. And so we, next summer I had to raise more money lawn mowing and in, yes, you can mow lawns in Phoenix, but at any rate, I raised my money doing that. We did that. And I think my parents finally gave in. We started going nearly every summer to the parks at that time, uh, uh, that was a little after Walt Disney World had opened. I really wanted to go there, but that was like too far away and too expensive and uh, for airline flights back then. And at any rate, I grew into this interest. I decided I wanted to fix what was wrong with Disney uh, films at that time, like The Black Cauldron. And so I wrote Ron Miller um who you know diane disney's husband who was over the studio asked if i could have a tour toured it when i was like 16 17 oh wow uh, the, and so i have a lot of memories of the disney studios fast forward i i realized that's not a, a real viable lifestyle being a film director and uh, i went into organizational training and development and that required really getting a master's degree which required doing a thesis and i thought okay, when am I going to do the thesis? I started going through all these different topics and they were all awful. And my professor said, you know, whatever you choose, you got to do something you absolutely love because you, you're you going to hate this by the time it's done. So I thought really hard one Sunday morning about what would it be? And I finally decided it would be about Disney educational media and the histori- history of it and the variables of that make Disney um, educational media work. So I wrote Dave Smith of the archives and sure enough, he gave me permission. So I'm back at the studio. I wrote that. I had this desire to work for Disney, but didn't know where that would come. In the meantime, my jobs took me from Arizona to Little Rock to Dallas to the panhandle of Florida. I eventually ended up in Orlando, not working for Disney, but managing being the director of operations for a water park down there which was just a really s- crazy side job, but it taught me the the business of operations. Anyway, any rate, that lasted a couple of years, and then I said, I got to really find this job. And I ultimately landed a terrific job, which was with the Disney University Professional Development Programs. And I say that because there was a book that came out in the 80s that said, hey, if you really want to see what excellence looks like, then you should go and benchmark them. You should go see them and look at them. And one of the things that they they recommended was Disney. And all of a sudden, the phone was off the hook with people calling in and saying, I want to learn about your philosophy on customer service and how you do Disney. And by the way, show me that tunnel underneath and all of that kind of stuff. And that created a business of training, but not cast members, training other people, corporations who came to Disney. And so when I joined, it was called Disney University Professional Development Programs. But at the same time, Eisner and Jan- and his wife, Jane, had come up with this idea of a Chautauqua-type style place where you could learn gardening and cooking and do rock climbing and all those things. And it was called the Disney Institute. It was a disaster after 35 million was spent to redo that area. And, uh, but they had to kind of make it look good. So they said, well, you know what? Those Disney University professional programs, they don't have a home. They were just, we were just working out of the hotel ballrooms. Why don't we make that the home? We'll combine the two. Maybe you guys could figure out how to do some cooking classes as part of your professional development. We were like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> but that's how it became known as the Disney Institute. I was with them through the 90s. And then I had an opportunity to join a consulting firm that taught me the business of consulting and gave me a chance to really take my skills to another level. And so I left Disney, which was just really the hardest thing I ever did because I loved wearing the name tag. But this was an opportunity and it was more money and it was all those kinds of things, better schedule and that type of thing, more independence. So anyway, long story short, I'd be in D.C. and other places doing business programs. 
And I think, uh, I really miss back home. Fortunately, we were still living in DC, we're just fly- or in Orlando, just flying up. I started to look at websites like Mouse Planet and MySage. Well, yeah, MySage back when it was called, mm-hmm. and um, Laughing Place and all those. And at the same time, Disney had come out with a book. We had decided when we were at Disney that we should write a book about Disney best practices because other people were writing them and they were terrible books and then they were just wrong. So we said, suggested this. It went up the ladder. Michael Eisner agreed to it, but he said it had to, we had to hire a ghostwriter. And yet I'm the one who had written all the content for all the programming. My job at Disney was to be in charge of all the customer service programming. And so I knew that. I knew the property back and forth where most cast members only get to like be in one location and maybe a couple of years later they transfer. I was all over the place. I was up to the top of the Tower of Terror, literally on this on the roof, to the bottom of the Living Seas. Everywhere and anywhere I could go, I was looking for places to take guests, talk about best in business practices at Disney. The book didn't get written. It was sent to another ghostwriter after we pleaded to, to Michael. And that was about the time I left. And the book finally came out and I was not happy with the book. And I felt like they didn't really write it. And of course, I thought it was my book to begin with. So I then thought, you know what? I Somebody needs to carry these stories for it because they're really amazing stories of Disney. And I don't think, especially now that I've left, that it's going to be carried forward. I started, so I reached out and ended up writing for Mouse Planet back in 2007, I think it was, somewhere in that neighborhood. And I kind of collected those articles, and that became ultimately the wonderful world of customer service at Disney. And then I wrote some other books that were about Disney and not about Disney. I wrote a book, uh, my favorite, I think, until this one maybe, was Disney's Hollywood Studios from Showbiz to Your Biz. I just, there's so many stories out there that tell the stories of Disney and that can be applied to your own not just your own organization, but to you to kind of step back and say, what are, what are your dreams? What's your vision? What are your challenges? What are your struggles? How would you take these ideas from this experience that Walt or Michael Eisner had or or my, Bob Iger and apply them to your life and to what you do? I eventually started my own company, started a couple of companies, and we have been delivering these messages and writing books. And ultimately, it led to my own website, my own podcast. And it's just been a great journey. So fast forward to the 100th anniversary of this company. And I knew that it was coming. I knew it was coming because I knew when the 50th anniversary came. I had gotten a placard. I I used to write Disney when I was a teenager. And I got this placard celebrating the 50th anniversary of Disney. What really stood out was the fact that a lot of people know, or hopefully know, because of D23, that the company was established in 1923. Most people don't know what the date was, the actual month and day. But the month and day was October 16th of 1923. That is when Walt and Roy signed a contract um, to renew his efforts to create the Alice series that he had started in Kansas, but went bankrupt and couldn't complete. And so that is considered the date. Dave Smith determined that date and, and wrote a memo to Card Walker saying, I think this is what the date ought to be. And Card was like, yeah, let me get past Walt Disney World opening and I'll talk to you about that. So I knew that date because not only because of that, because but because October 16th is also my birthday. So I share this thing in common with Disney. And so, I've always, so here it is coming the 100th. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And I kind of felt like, OK, I don't know what Disney's going to do on this 100th. But I know I need to do something. And so I set out to write this book. And then three or 400 pages into it, I said, I've got problems. This is too big. And so in talking to my editor, we agreed probably what needed to happen is that there needed to be two volumes. And so that's how we created volume one, which is 1923 to 1973, the first 50 years, which is largely the Walt and Roy Disney years, plus a a couple of extra after that. My choice was to celebrate the 100th anniversary by sharing the stories of this 
of this organization and the lessons that can be learned from it. And what's unique in my my chapters is that every chapter ends with an opportunity to say, okay, so what are the ideas for the next century? So think about these things. How do they apply to you? And to use that as a springboard to kind of suggest, okay, this may have happened 80 years ago, but what does it mean to me in my life moving forward? And and how is this relevant? And that's that's the style of the books that I write. And it's it's just what I love doing because in my real life, that's what I do. I spend time consulting with organizations and helping them improve their customer service, their leadership, their dysfunctional uh, employee <laughs> engagement levels, their teams, all of that, creativity, innovation. I do all of that. And it's um, it's just that I love to share the stories of Disney as part of that. Wow. You covered so much during that, but I will, I will stay focused on the book here, but I will say, <laughs> you know, you referenced having to split it up to, you know, after 300, 400 pages, but even so, when you decide, okay, I'm doing 50 years, there's a lot to cover, as we've seen with giant biographies of Walt Disney or other you know, history books that focus just on one thing. How did you narrow it down where even with shorter chapters and kind of focusing on the takeaways, how do you narrow it down where you're only doing, was it a challenge to do that to, okay, I'm going to talk about Snow White, but I'm going to do just a chapter or so. How do you zone in on what you want to talk about? Oh, yeah, that was a huge dilemma. And not just what are the stories or the events. Mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure that the people were acknowledged right. because there were so many who helped to make this successful. I didn't want to leave so many of those individuals out. They're just they're just part of the fabric that that makes up this tapestry. And yeah, it was it was clearly obvious the advent of Mickey Mouse, Snow White. Disneyland, uh, right. Walt Disney, those are those are an obvious thing. But then you get into the details. Well, you know, uh, what do you cover about the 1940s? This was a very difficult period going into World War II until Cinderella came out in 1950. These were difficult, but that's a whole 10 years of the company. So do you talk about victory through air power, which is <laughs> the animated film? Most have never seen, didn't even know existed. I've seen but it. this was a critical piece. Yeah, well, we could do a whole review right here, couldn't we? Yeah. But pieces like that, I had to really, what films do we cover? I couldn't, I just couldn't move forward without talking about 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. That was a major moment. To talk about the true life adventure films, that was a major catalyst. And then I got to the parks and I'm like, You know, obviously, we're going to talk about the opening and how those parks got opened or how they came to even be uh, imagined. But there's some real milestones by 73. I mean, some of the most signature pieces that we liken to Disney, It's a Small World, Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, Jungle Cruise. These are signature pieces. They are as important to the legacy as some of Disney's best films. And I just, I felt like these things have to be acknowledged too. I may not be able to talk, have enough space to talk about the bathroom of tomorrow, but I will <laughs> Come find some space. I know, I know. <laughs> but I will find space to talk about these important signature events. At the same time, I'm also having to focus on this, the relationship between Walt and Roy and that evolution that is the thread that makes those first 50 years happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating to learn more about them. Well, in your book, but then also Bob Thomas is both of his books about Walt and Roy are so good. And there's just so much, especially the Roy book is so interesting to really dig into that. But in your book, too, you do, what I appreciate is you do mention challenges, because one thing I think about is the strike, which... Um, That is such a big moment in their history. I mean, so how did you kind of, because I know you're writing a book that ultimately is inspiring and is going to have takeaways that are positive, but how do you kind of thread the needle where you talk about the challenges, but then how they overcame them? There's just so much to learn about how you work. There's two events that paralleled each other. In the aftermath of Snow White, here is a man who thinks that the greatest thing he could do for his employees 
is build the most amazing studio possible. And so he takes all the profits and frankly goes back into debt again Mm. to build this beautiful studio that is still there today. It is that powerful and a piece and the detail and focus he put on it was so impressive. He really thought through the process of animation, how it would be laid out in the studio. But same time, his artists, they weren't looking for a new studio. They were looking for some serious bonus checks after you made all that money on Snow White. So where are the bonus checks? And that became its own friction. And then you created some things that where he thought, okay, I need to really do something very, very nice for my top animators. So in the new studio, he creates this thing called the Penthouse Club, which sounds like a brilliant thing, you know, to really reward with a really nice space, kind of club-like thing. They work out and get have a little meal if they want and so forth. Well, now all of a sudden, you have just divided up your people and you have created a strata where before they were all at Hyperion Studios playing softball including Walt, out on the backfield and just kind of enjoying that flattening of the organization. Nothing flattens an organization like playing softball. So, in fact, I was with a client yesterday, and I said, tell me about a great leader. And somebody named a leader. I said, what made that leader great? And somebody raised their hand and said, you know, we had a softball team, and that leader came out and played softball with us. It, it isn't softball. Softball is the magic thing. But it's the idea that I, like you, we flatten the organization. Now, Roy, well, I'm sorry, Walt did that in many ways. He insisted everybody call him Walt. There was no mister. There were no big titles in the organization. He had no interest in those. And so that flattened the organization. He continues to do so today, even with the name tags and so forth. But at the same time, this little, this little riff came into play. I don't think he was intending to create a riff. He, he certainly wasn't. But it was the outcome. And then when they got critical, he was hurt. He was deeply hurt. I've spent, and he could have taken all the money and just given it to himself, like I know a lot of CEOs these days, but he didn't. He invested it back in an organization and wasn't appreciated for it. And he was hurt. And the strike really tore at him in very painful ways. I, I have to tell you, uh, for my birthday, I got a hundred anniversary lego which is a camera stand that has all these things but it has a little tiny mini mini fig of walt but what's <laughs> funny about the mini fig his hair goes on top you know that uh, that you put on top of the head well you could actually turn the head so you have a happy visionary walt on one side or you take off the hair turn it around and you have the grumpy walt on the other <laughs> side i thought this is an amazing detail to include in a lego of all things walt and two faces it, walt had those moments he was not a perfect leader he had difficulty really praising employees that'll do was usually the expression he used he didn't see And it wasn't that he didn't care about his employees or that he didn't reward them per se. He just was so focused on the end deliverable. And he thought that the greatest compliment I can pay to you is to include you on this phenomenally cool thing we are doing at the New York World's Fair or this next movie or whatever. That's what he thought was a great way to recognize employees. And many employees got that, understood that, and had experiences, Bob Gurr, for instance, and others doing amazing things. But at the same time, that traditional pat on the back and oh, I just want to tell you how good it. There are wonderful stories about Walt very quietly and very individually touching the lives of his employees. But they were the exceptions, not something you would regularly regularly see. And it was confusing to many of the employees trying to read Walt and trying to understand um, what it was like. By the way, Roy, you could have sat on a bench and talked with him any day. It didn't matter who you were. You just uh, chit chat, yik yak, flim flam, as we say at at the Country Bear Jamboree. And he'd just be fine with that. But Walt didn't like small talk. He was always focused on the project. He just had so many dreams, so many ideas, and it was just really hard for him to sit back and just talk about you as an individual. That was hard. 
with Walt Disney, were there surprises, things you learned that you didn't know? Because I know you've written other books, so you've obviously read quite a bit about Walt Disney, but doing this book as you kind of zoned in on him, were there things about him you didn't know beforehand? I'll be honest, no. That little National Geographic magazine is now 10 bookshelves worth of of books and magazines and things I've gathered over the years. So I've really kind of come to know him. It was a synthesis of things, not reinventing something new. However, I did feel really strongly, again, going back to it, it wasn't going to be just painting a happy, you know, Walt, but to really look at some message, some important key moments. One of those came after my editor had gone through the first review of the book. And I took another look after her comments came in and I thought, there's a story I'm missing here and I can't not include it. And the story is that as Walt built out his organization, well, the brothers, first of all, had incorporated and now that made them responsible to report to shareholders. And uh, Walt really didn't care for that. You know, he was glad for anybody who wanted to invest and he provided a great return. But he didn't want anybody telling him what to build or have him. He didn't like the idea of reporting. And he, he, he'd he constantly go to Roy and say, you take care of those shareholder meetings. I don't want. And yet the shareholders said, well, where's Walt? You know, and that type of, this became friction. And it became a, a, it became a big reality as Disneyland was created because he needed a team of people he could dedicate toward building the attractions for the park. Well, there ain't nothing on the uh, the ledger at the studios for Imagineering or anything that that might have been called at that time. And so he started his own organization to take care of that. And he funded it with his own money. And it actually became a separate organization for some period of time. But as the attractions became more important, and as that group became bigger and bigger, especially during the New York World's Fair, it became a sticking point between he and Roy, and they had some very difficult conversations. Roy felt that it should all be housed under Disney. Well, it wasn't that he wouldn't give in to that, but he was expecting serious money for it and and and, and certain rights and so forth. Not because he cared about money, it's because he wanted to take it and go do something else. And most importantly, he wanted that independence. And he did not want to be beholden to it. So this got to be a very difficult fight between them. And it was, in many ways, a fight. Cardwalker ended up being kind of the middle guy that they would kind of go in between. And they kind of went back and forth for some period of time. Finally, it just it really got ugly. And they recognized that they really did need to. And Walt's attorney made it even uglier. But they finally came to a realization they had to address this. And so Roy came into a meeting where this was being discussed at one point. And he said, look, none of us would be here if it were not for my brother. Your pay, your benefits, everything you have is because of his contribution to this organization. He knew that he would just simply be a banker at a bank if it wasn't for his brother. And so he acquiesced in a very, just a very humble way. Mind, mind you, he's the older brother too, buddy. What is like seven years? He's the older brother and he's acquiescing to his younger brother and taking the humbler route, the road less traveled. And that resolved the issue in recognition of coming to terms with it. Walt presented to Roy an Indian peace pipe with a note saying the the clouds we smoke together are beautiful and roy took that and he put it up on his next to a picture of walt that was in his office and cherished that a lot of people don't know that but that these are the kinds of things these are the hard things that made made the studio uh that challenged the studio even though you would look at that same period and say wow this is a great period you got mary poppins you got a world's fair you got disneyland it's so cool you know well no there were sticking issues and fortunately they were resolved because it was only a handful of years that roy lost his brother yeah, I mean, you reference the things you reference were only a few years before 1966. It's yeah. cra- it's always crazy to me to think about that really the like 10 years from Disneyland opening on how many things happened in that stretch of time 
And you reference Pirates and Haunted Mansion and the World's Fair because you do you do go into those a bit when you're looking at something. Because I mean, they, like you know, there have been entire multiple books written about Haunted Mansion and written about pirates and everything. <laughs> how do you write a chapter on those? How do you zone in? I mean, I'm not saying you're regurgitating. I just mean, how do you zone in on what you want to be the takeaways from like a Haunted Mansion or pirates? Well, that is that is the litmus test. What is the takeaway of this? Um, you know, I love the stretching ghosts, but what is the stretching ghost telling me about my life? What is it? To... But when you peel away this situation, where this has gone on in different various levels of of development and so forth. And then all of a sudden, Walt is gone. And now you're having to figure out what the next, what this thing is going to look like. I mean, you've already built the building. (laughs) You've got the facade. You know you're going to have a building in the back, but how is it all going to be put together? I think because of other projects like Pirates, where Claude Coates had really been a master at laying it out and uh, and then mark davis was so good at creating characters and um events in there that really kind of had its own life and its own exp- experience i think it became very obvious that there needed to be some kind of collaboration some kind of compromise and that was that that's what i title it the spirit the spirit of compromise because when the thing opened, I remember I waited outside Disneyland for three hours for my brothers who stood in line that first summer to ride that attraction because it was so, so popular that first summer. And three teenage brothers, and I was too scared. I, I may have been only eight or nine, but I was too scared. I thought this sounds really scary. <laughs> and I, I had a little idea, right? They came out of that thing and they said, Yeah, it was kind of cool, but it wasn't scary. They were all looking for scary, you know? Yeah, there's a moment or two. It wasn't really scary. That's how the audience looked at the Haunted Mansion. Ah, that was okay. That was scary. The the Haunted Mansion you and I treasure, where we, I still, and I have been on the Haunted Mansion at least 250, 300 times in my life over the years, so many times. I still see little details I have never seen before. But you didn't get that the first summer at Disneyland. But it was the right compromise. It was the right level of stuff. And it has endured for years and years and years. And yeah, we we add back in things or add things in and so forth. That hat box ghost, that, that hat box ghost was the centerpiece. In my view, if you look at the album covers and the artwork that were done, that hat box ghost was centerpiece. They just couldn't get the thing to work. And they actually built both things at the same time. This was this was just like the Little Mermaid a couple of years ago was built and Star Wars Galaxy. Yeah. That attraction was built at the same time. The Haunted Mansion was the first thing completed. They wrapped the whole thing up in that show building behind the, the show building was done and the ride was done before the house out front in Liberty Square was even completed. That was the first thing done because they'd done two of them. It was amazing how they came together. And I think that it's a sense of compromise, we could use that a little bit more, not only in business and personal life, but maybe around the world today. You referenced the Haunted Mansion. I remember going when I was younger and we enjoyed it, but I feel like just overall even since like the 90s it's more popular now like it's grown i think because of the internet and because of everything it's grown to be so popular and i i appreciate it more now than i did when i was younger because again you're kind of thinking more in terms of thrills where now like you said you know especially disneyland which i haven't been on as much because i i went to disney world more it's something and i think like you said getting to your point about the spirit of compromise because it's multiple visions with the Mark Davis and Claude Coates and a little bit of Rolly Crump and a little bit of the earlier figures involved in it, like um, Ken Anderson, it's not something that was manufactured. Like, you'll see a new ride now that might have the most greatest technology. Some of them, some are amazing. And they don't have that because, again, this was kind of like, nothing could be developed like this anymore. I mean, just because of the small number of people and the strong visions, I think. Well, you know, I don't know if you've ever been underneath the 
haunted mansion under the ride system inside no i have not i I did this as a cast i did this as a cast member and because we were looking at it for um tours although they were very specific they decided they only want to do youth tours and we were doing adults but at any rate i did have a chance to go in there and this is the thing that absolutely blew me away about that it is so plain and simple there is this is not a tricky effect when you get to that ballroom it is it is mannequins on turntables Mm. and the use of lights going off and on and that's it but yet we love that part it just takes us to a whole nother place because it's not that it's a it's not that it's a high-tech effect it's that the high-tech effect is done perfectly with all of the elements if you had a little bleed of light if you had some trash laying in there on the on the on the uh, on the floor, if if it wouldn't take much before you just ruined the entire effect. As it is, it's perfect, simple, but perfect. And I think there's a little message in that too. Oh yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen videos of it with the lights on, and somehow it doesn't make you know like you think oh it ruins the trick. No, I actually am more amazed by it. And when I write it, I don't think yeah. oh I know how this is done. I think. You just totally, it takes you away. Like you said, it's not, you know, there are some rides where you're like riding and all of a sudden you just see this like exit door to your right and you're like, okay. But I never feel that kind of experience at Haunted Mansion. Yeah, I'm sure there are exit doors, don't get me wrong, but I don't think about it. I'm not looking for that because you're so invested in it. Not to veer too much away from your book, but I mean, I could talk about the Haunted Mansion. Or yeah, we could, forever. we could. <laughs> and, and, and rightly so, because it really has earned its place in time. Absolutely. Totally. Well, you referenced your massive bookshelf. Um, I'm curious for you, either with this book or just in general, I mean, beyond your own books, are there certain books or sources that you find yourself like really helpful or really good resources? They don't have to just be books too. It can be anything. I'm just curious, like whether for your enjoyment or for your research, like what are kind of the things you find yourself going back to a lot? Oh yeah. Well, I, you referenced Bob Thomas's work. And it is so, so fundamental. If, if you were to, outside of my books, okay, buy my books, but but really, <laughs> but if you don't have Bob Thomas's books, you got to buy. And I and not just Walt Disney American Original, but also Roy Disney. Uh, his book is just so pivotal. So I really treasure those two things. The first big book, the first book I got out after the magazine was about a, a little less than a year later. Christmas came around and Christopher Finch's The Art of Walt Disney came out. It was a massive, you know, four inch book. (laughs) And it cost at that time at the Broadway department store $50. That was a boatload of money in 1973 or so. And, uh, and I begged my parents, I said, I don't care. I don't need anything else. And I didn't get anything else. I got, I think underwear that, Christmas and that book. And I tell you, I poured over that book. And and it's funny because they spend a lot of time in the era of Walt, of Mickey, of the Silly Symphonies. That was one of the things that really struggled, I struggled with because Silly Symphonies is dozens of films created with abstract topics. And then at the same time, Mickey Shorts, which which included like Goofy and Pluto, like Clock Cleaners and and um, through the mirror, those were being created. And it's understanding the evolution of all of that. And people talk about the old mill, for instance, and they talk about a skeleton dance, but there were really a lot of little things that were going on to really finesse the art that gets you to Snow White at the end. So I love, I love that book. I don't know that it's in print anymore. I, for my birthday, I just got the nickel tour of this oh, Disneyland I don't have nickel that. tour. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And let me just I've say heard it's cost, amazing. It cost a lot more than that $50 art. Yes. <laughs> That's why I don't have it. My my wife gave me the eye and said, You gotta be kidding me. I go, I know this is crazy, but it's the last, it's the one book I've never had. Randy Bright's uh Disneyland Inside Story. I think it's a great one. I think it's one of the one of the best ones on Disneyland. And, and of course, I'm referencing more of the stories for the first volume. You get into the second volume. Michael Eisner's book is a great book. 
Marty Scalar's book is a great book. I don't know if you've had a chance to read Jim Cora's book. A lot of people don't know who Jim Not Cora was. Not yet. I know who Jim Cora is. It is definitely on my list. He plays. He year. played a pivotal role with Tokyo Disney, and he's going to be in the volume two. One of the best pieces in that, Dan, is there is a conversation between Frank Wells and Jim Cora. And this must have been like 1988 or something like that. You know, so about four or five years. He goes, and Frank asks the question of, of Jim. He goes, okay, well, we just put the ticket price at Disneyland at $31.32, something like that. Do you think we've now hit the top of what we could charge for that <laughs> ticket? <laughs> you want to roll at that point because you're going, oh, my gosh. But anything involving Frank Wells is something to be understood. Um, there's a little-known book of Roy E. Disney, I think is worthy. Uh, I think it's remembering Roy E. Disney. I think that's a great little book in the post. But definitely Marty Scalar's book, I think, is a, is important for understanding. Again, this will be in volume two, but there is a dynamic and a tension that develops between Imagineering and park operations. And dealing with that tension and why that existed. And I think that's something that needs to be understood, even though both did a fantastic job. I love Dick Nunes for many, many reasons, but but Dick was a pressure point at many different given parts of the company's history. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't have the quality standards we have today if it hadn't been for Dick Nunes. But at the same time, there were bridges that sometimes got burned along the way. And so looking at the at, at these and and saying in a great way, I uh, two things I don't like. I don't like just glossing and saying, oh, the past is so wonderful, you know. But I also don't like things that just pick apart and criticize. We don't have the context of having been in the past with people. But I do think we can have a constructive conversation. Okay. What was working here? What wasn't working here? And what can we learn from it going forward? And I think these leaders are fantastic at at their stories and and their experiences and how they the commitment and dedication cost several of them their marriages. That is something that you know you wouldn't. I hope you wouldn't see today. There's a great conversation. Oh, head of Pixar, um, not Lasseter, but Ed, um, Ed, Ed, Ed Catmull. Ed Yes. Ed, Ed Catmull was really great at putting some balance on the issue of the idea that you can pretty well ask anything of people who are passionate and committed and dedicated to, to what you're doing. But should you? Should you ask anything? So there's a great story where they got into a big situation where they had to pull in Toy Story 2 at the same time they were pulling in Bugs to Bugs Life. So big that most people don't know that the animation for Tough to Be a Bug wasn't even done by Pixar. It was outsourced. That's why you see a bunch of bugs. You don't even, they hadn't even got to that point, but they were so overwhelmed trying to meet their deadlines. Right. They couldn't They couldn't do that film. Uh, they gave guidance to the two main characters, but all the other characters were just non-Pixar. They, they don't show up today. But notwithstanding, there was so much friction at one point that one of the animators at Pixar realized about two o'clock in the afternoon, well, when his wife called and said, hey, how come you didn't take the baby to daycare today? At which point he realized he was so overwhelmed by his deadlines, he had left his baby in the car. Oh, my gosh. And so he ran out to the car fortunately the baby survived and lived but it was a big moment at pixar where they said okay we need to have a little bit more balance here and we need to rethink that and i think that's a message to anyone i i know what it's like to give it all but is that really what we need to do is it that we we need to have some balance into it and fast forward fast forward bob Iger comes back from, you know, and his take two yeah. after JPEG <laughs> leaves. And he comes to the offices. He's ready to get going. He's ready to turn Disney around. He gets in there. And what does he find? Nobody's there. COVID. Everybody's, everybody's, you know, phoning it in, uh, you know, from, 
from home. It's all Zoom meetings. And he's sitting there going, I'm supposed to turn this place around with Zoom meetings? You know, it's a it's a it's legitimate question, you know. And so these are kinds of the issues and, and challenges that they face. But, boy, so many good lessons to learn. And sorry to get into volume two. We're no, no, I was going to ask one, you about but... it. You led right into what I was going to ask you next. But um, just to hit on a few of the things you said, the Marty Sklarberg book is so interesting because, again, he is so willing. He will talk about it. He'll be like. I was so mad at Dick Nunes or, you know, some of the other operation guys. And you read it and you're like, that is not the Marty Sklar that I picture when I see him on doing interviews. But it's great. It's really interesting. And then, yeah, like you said, you've got Dick Nunes's book. You've got, I'm glad that we're starting to get more info about some of the more recent era. But I'm curious yeah. for you writing this book because, you know, the like you said, the first 50 years, most, I mean, it's Roy at the very end, but Walden Roy. This one, you've got, you know, you've got Ron Miller and Card Walker and you've got Epcot and then the challenges there and Eisner, Disneyland Paris, and and then, you know, Iger, Chapek, Iger, the whole thing. How do you, <laughs> this seems harder for you to rein in into a book. How do you do that? Yeah, well, that, that's exactly where I'm at on volume two, which actually will have more chapters than volume one as far as as it's been laid out and 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 in the process where i'm at in writing my hope is to have something by spring of next year but the reality of it is is um when you get to the 50th anniversary of the company which is where we end volume one you get to 1973 and you find a little company doing well period a little company doing well period it was still the bottom of all of the studios out there in terms of sales and so forth. And it had not done well. 70s, despite your best efforts toward Island at the top of the world and Pete's <laughs> Dragon and, oh yeah, Black Cauldron, and, or not Black Cauldron, but black the Black Hole. Black Hole, yeah. All those things. They were trying, but it just wasn't happening. And so you had this moment where it's nice, you know, but it is, we're, we're building this new coaster called Space Mountain. Maybe that'll be really cool. But they're in a point right there that they have a nice little company. And they have no idea that within 10 years, this thing is going to blow up at in a way that no one ever imagined. You know, you have to, you have to acknowledge the fact that Eisner took this thing to a juggernaut level that you couldn't just even imagine back in 1973 as they saw it. So now fast forward and here we are, it's 2023 and we have a company that is celebrating its hundredth anniversary. And by the way, that's pretty miraculous. Companies don't last a hundred years and it's a nice company. Um, it's actually the, one of the biggest, if not the biggest entertainment firm in the gun in the world, but it's got some challenges. Whether it's politics, whether it's economics, whether it's cultural, they've got problems just like they did back in 1973, which at that point was a recession. At that point, you had Richard Nixon this week, by the way. Well, if at the time we're recording, yeah. I think it was November 16th. So what days are we recording? It's November 16th. It, I think it's it November was, 16th. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was November 16th that he got up at the Contemporary Resort Hotel and said, I am not a crook. And, um, and of course, then you have the whole Watergate thing. So, so many things, culturally things were just in a messy place. There was a, I remember seeing the AP photo of Disneyland's parking lot in 1973 during the energy crisis on a weekend day. The parking lot is not even half full. There were problems in 1973, and guess what? There are problems in 1923, or 2023, in 2023. There were also problems in, in 1923. Hey, we got problems, but that's 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 the reality of life. That isn't it. And yet you want to just celebrate and just have this all-out party for 100 years, and the company can't seem to get beyond its current little challenges trying to get there. And who knows? Between now and the 150th anniversary of the Walt Disney Company, who knows just what this thing may just be like. It may be something we can't even imagine now. We're just, as Walt says, we're just getting started. 
Well, yeah, I mean, right. The things that are challenges at the moment, coming off the pandemic, streaming, figuring that out, the parks, you know, whatever, climate change, whatever you want to pick, who knows what even in 10, 20, 30, like you said, 50 years, it'll be something different. I hope they survive. I mean, they survived the early 80s where they nearly got taken over. And then even again, before Iger came in, there were some challenges there. And Paris almost closed. There's so many things, but they survived. And I think they're going to come through it. I think a lot of companies are struggling, but it's going to be it's going to be interesting. Um, fodder for you know 50 years when you're um, yeah. The next let's run. get together on that one. Let's uh... <laughs> we'll do the pod- I don't think we're podcasting in 50 years, but or whatever the <laughs> podcast is, we'll just be standing in the same room, but like holograms. <laughs> yes. Thing. But before we finish, I want to ask you just a couple of questions. Yeah. I'm curious about you and your interest in Disney. Um, you mentioned the Haunted Mansion. What are, are there other favorite attractions that like when you go to the parks or your, that your favorites that are there now or the past or wherever? I'm curious. People ask me all the time, which is better? Pirates of the Caribbean, the traditional one or the one in Shanghai? Or how does Pirates compare to Rise of the Resistance? I got to tell you, my number one favorite attraction is Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Or or Tokyo Disneyland, which is done supremely well. Um, Shanghai is really great, too. And Rise is really great, Um, depending on the day you get there. If the effects are working. If the effects are working. I've never seen the Kylo Ren animatronic. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <Never>. <laughs> that's that's a problem isn't it <laughs> so so it it, it really is it, it is very very and by the way they had the same thing down in pirates in its opening years it went up and down in its opening years now i say pirates is just the best of the best of the best because i have spent nearly 60 years with pirates and right. so i so i attach something very emotional to it so you can't go wrong on on Pirates of the Caribbean. But I got to say that there are so many other things that are so really fantastic out there that are just great attractions uh, to be enjoy. I, I, my signature at the end of my podcast is always follow the compass of your heart. And it's based on an attraction at Tokyo Disney called Sinbad, based on Sinbad. Sinbad's Golden Voyage, I think it is. And it's just charming as is small world i gotta tell you the walt disney world version not so much but when you get to the hong kong version or the tokyo version that was redone you you're just blown away the new paris version is also very nice so when i see these i you can't go wrong with these attractions these are great attractions and so i just really yeah, I really love it, but I but I love the new things. I love Rise of the, I love everything from Rise of the Resistance to the Alice in Wonderland small a dark ride. Why don't we have more Alice in Wonderland dark rides? I don't know. <laughs> don't know why, but I just love all of it and it it um it's really yeah, it's it's just really great to be part. I think Guardians of the Galaxy did a great job. I've enjoyed Tron since I first wrote it in Shanghai. I think those coasters make me um, very comfortable with saying I no longer need to ruin my back on Space Mountain. So I think I'll just <laughs> stay on these attractions. And uh, and I'm good with that. Um, so I do still have my heart very much in Disneyland, the original. And with things like Radiator Springs Racers and, and Indiana Jones Adventure, how can you go wrong, you know? But I live in Orlando, and my children have grown up around Walt Disney World, and so I see, I see newer memories with them in it. And it's I have a great reverence for the American Adventure, mm-hmm. and the messages there, and the messages in Spaceship Earth either. Do they need some touching up? Particularly, uh, well, you just you just talked about that. <laughs> I so was we, definitely we in did. the weeds recently. Yeah, you were definitely, and and rightfully so, because there's some some needs there that come on, could be so amazing. I'm not to say that what has been created up to this point hasn't been really great. No, but no, it I could still be like it. so yeah. much more. It is the signature attraction to Epcot, and there's just nothing like it. Just the addition of the LED lights and that LED, whatever that we call those lights on the outside. 
just oh, took, took, yeah. took Spaceship Earth to a whole nother level. I really would like to, I'm really excited to see what, if World Showcase does nothing more than plant about 80 trees, I, uh, not World Showcase, I'm sorry, if World Celebration, when it opens, has nothing more than about 80 trees planted, I will be thrilled. Because if you remember, going from Spaceship Earth, the oh, World yeah. Showcase was this, this purple shaded blight of sunshine that just, it was killer to go through during the days. <laughs> And there are a lot of things that people reminisce about certain attractions, but I keep thinking, I think our memory is 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 lost in time a little bit. Yeah, I agree. I mean, yes, I'll talk a lot about old attractions, which I love. I mean, there's plenty of attractions, but like you said, I grew up. You grew up a lot going to Disneyland. I grew up a lot going to Epcot and to Magic Kingdom. So some of those old attractions I did as a kid that aren't there, I still like. Oh, but yes, I also. I mean, there's plenty of really. I love. All the stuff at Pandora is really cool. And I don't even love the Avatar movie very much. Mm. And Star Wars and a lot of the, you know, and we just went to Disneyland with my family. And that was the first time they had done like Radio Springs Racers, my girls. And um, a lot of the attractions there, though Indiana Jones broke while we were in line. Oh. Never wrote it, which <laughs> I, I've written before. I heard you say that. Yes. Oh, I've oh. written it before. Oh. But the, we talk about it. We were in that queue for over an hour. My my one of my daughters is like, I'm never going on that again. We stood in that queue for so long. But not to not to make this about me. But I will just say, I agree with you. I think Pirates of Disneyland, if it's not my favorite, one of my favorites that's still around, just because it feels like the Disney World one is good, but it's missing parts. But yeah, there's so many. New, old. I'm just happy when they're putting in new things that show a care and attention to detail and the things that I enjoy, which they're still doing. Disney had a ticket book system of A through E tickets. And we know what the E tickets represent, but people forget how important the A and the B's and the C's were Mm -hmm. because it balanced out your time there. I see too many people who go off and do three E style attractions and they think there's nothing else to see in the park. And I say, you are missing the park and what i do love is not sure if you've seen it yet but the moana way of water yes i have have some concerns about its functionality day in day out but they have done a charming job with that it is a solid piece i also look at this new swiss family treehouse it opening up at disneyland and i think this is good this is good. And these are not, these are B ticket style attractions. These are not major attractions. These are B ticket attractions. And I think that's fantastic that they have taken little gems like that and created them. They are as important to the park experience as is, you know, the big hitters like Test Track and Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what they're missing at Hollywood Studios. But um, Journey of Water, I have not seen yet in person. But I'm happy that it's not, it's new. It's, it's not replace like they did with Ratatouille. It didn't replace anything. It's like Tron. It's something in addition, which what they, those parks are bursting at the seams. They need to add things. So that's, it's great. And B tickets too. I mean, I love mis- going to Mr. Lincoln at, at Disneyland. And one of the reasons is because I can just walk right in and sit down. You need <laughs> things like that. You need things especially. But I, I could go on forever. You know, there's there's so much to experience. Before we finish, I want to make sure, because I know beyond writing this newest book, there are a lot of things you're doing. You referenced your podcast. You reference your businesses and everything else. And I would love to give you time to talk about those. And also if people want to learn more, connect with you or do anything like what, where could they go? Well, thank you. Um, Disney insights is kind of the, the place that the thing to type in, because that leads to DisneyInsights.com, My, my blog page, it leads to my podcast, Disney insights. I have a YouTube page, Disney insights. I call it Disney Insights because, again, it's not just about my love and fandom of Disney, but the insights we get from it. And that's why I refer to it as Disney Insights. Yeah, there's lots of books. Yeah, there's lots of podcasts. Just enjoy them. Some people, for instance, have come to the end of one of my books. And at the end of my books, they say, I say, look, if you need to infuse these things into your organization, just give me a call. My phone number is on the back and people call me up and they say, I just read that customer service book or that leadership book. 
I need to talk about those messages with my people. I need to create that level of, they don't need to be Disney. They need to learn from Disney and then become the best they can be. And that's what I help do through coaching, consulting, workshops, keynotes. Um, That's where I'm at right now. I'm actually with the Army Corps of Engineers out in Washington, working with them. I do it with public, private, nonprofit groups all throughout internationally from Singapore to South Africa and all over the United States. We help organizations improve their leadership, their customer service, their employee engagement, and just help elevate the quality of their work experience and customer delivery. And that's what we do. So anytime, just give me a call. Well, that that sounds great. And I really enjoyed the book. I'm looking forward to volume two. And um, it it was a a good read with a lot lot of fun insights. And this has been a lot of fun also, this podcast. Thank you so much, Jeff. This has been great. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, that was really fun. If you'd like to check out my other interviews with authors, former Imagineers, filmmakers, and more, go to tomorrowsociety.com slash podcast with the Ness at the end. You can also basically go back in your preferred podcast provider, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, whatever you use to scroll back. All the episodes are still there and you can check them out. If you'd like to help support the show and get access to some really cool perks, there's a great way to do so through Patreon. It really helps to keep the show moving forward. You can learn more by going to patreon.com slash tomorrow society. If you would like to contact me, you can email me at dan at tomorrowsociety.com. Let me know what you think of the show. I always love hearing suggestions for future topics and guests. You can also follow me on all the typical social media at Tomorrow Society. The music you are hearing right now was written by Adam Hookie and performed by the Sophisticated Babies. Next time, I will be talking with Seth Kuberski, the author of many books, including the unofficial guide to Disneyland. We are going to focus on Disneyland, but to also talk about a lot of other related theme park topics. Seth was on the show twice a while back. It's been years, so it's going to be great to check in. Seth, thank you so much for listening to this episode with J. Jeff Kober, and I will talk to you again next time.